<laughs> Allison's uh, Allison's been practicing, ladies and gentlemen. Go, but go easy on her anyway. Now the pressure's on, right? <laughs> yeah. All right. Stanley's in place. Right there. Uh, and we're ready to go. You ready to go? Am I recording? Are we doing really? this? Here we go. Let's do it. Episode two of the pre-roll. <laughs> Tim Moreau seeks out information on the tech news thieves by meeting a dark man in an even darker alley. Watch Tim's back. Support the Daily Show at bit.ly slash help DTNS. Next time on Ace Detective, find out what the shady informant has in store. This is the Daily Tech News for Monday, October 6th, 2014. I'm Tom Merritt, and joining me right now is Allison Sheridan, host of NosillaCast, Podfeet on Twitter, and just general woman about the internet. How you doing, Allison? I am doing fantastic. It's finally a tiny bit cooler here than the last three times. Yeah, uh, there were the people complaining about it being rainy in other parts of the world. I heard too. it snowed in Chicago earlier this week. Edward Snowden? <laughs> Chicago? Uh, we're going to talk about the big split in a few minutes. HP deciding to uh, go through mitosis and divide itself in half. But let's get to the headlines first. Uh, here's the headline on that. HP announced today it will split itself into two companies by the end of October of next year. That's the end of its fiscal year 2015. Hewlett Packard Enterprises will keep the bulk of the company with enterprise level IT offerings. Things like cloud storage, big data, servers. Meg Whitman, the current HP CEO, will be CEO of that company. The other company will be called HP Inc. It will get the personal systems and printing business, which means all the desktops and laptops and those lucrative printer ink sales, uh, and have current executive vice president of that division, Dion Weisler, as its CEO. Meg Whitman will also serve as chairman of the board for HP Inc.'s board of directors. Separate from the split, Ars Technica reports HP said its current round of layoffs will total 55,000 people. Jeez. Yeah. Well, we'll get more into that later. In other news, Facebook officially owns WhatsApp. TechCrunch reports that the deal closed for $4.5 billion and 177.7 million shares of Facebook stock, plus 45.9 million in restricted stock for WhatsApp employees. WhatsApp founder Jan Coombe will join Facebook's board and receive a salary of $1 plus almost 25 million units of Facebook stock. You know, when you get to like 24 plus million units of Facebook stock, you don't need more than a buck. Isn't that what Zuckerberg <laughs> does too? He only takes a buck of salary. Well, yeah. Didn't Steve Jobs start that? He was the first dollar I don't know. a year guy. He was the first tech guy that I remember doing it. But I know others, like I think Iacocca may have done that okay. back in the 80s or he something. He didn't invent $1, just made $1 I bet somebody did than everybody it before else. Iacocca. Probably some <laughs> Roosevelt or, or something. <laughs> Vanderbilt. Uh, GigaOM reports Redbox Instant will shut down tomorrow, October 7th. The streaming video service jointly operated by Verizon and Redbox hasn't been able to sign up new users in three months. Information on refunds will be emailed and posted on the Redbox Instant website October 10th. I wonder if you get to keep any videos you have when they shut down. Uh, yes, I think Redbox downloads will remain. I think I think I remember reading that the Redbox downloads will remain around. It's just the instant streaming service that's going to be. Oh, good. oh, oh, I gotcha, I gotcha. ZDNet reports GT Advanced, the company that sells Sapphire to Apple, has filed for bankruptcy. Now, I think this is that restructuring kind of bankruptcy, not the going out of business kind of bankruptcy. The company suffered a massive drop in share price after the latest iPhone did not use their material in its display glass. Apple still uses Sapphire in its rear camera lens and Touch ID fingerprint sensors, and the forthcoming Apple Watch will use Sapphire in its display. Yeah, so there'll be more Sapphire sales, but do you think that they were like banking on Apple using it as the screen for the iPhone 6? Yes. I mean, the way like the story literally written, banking on it. <laughs> well, the way the story's written, it was like, oh my gosh, our stock went down. Okay, we better file for bankruptcy. Yeah. But there's got to be other stuff going on if that's, that's kind of an effect, not a cause, I would think. That, that yeah. story's a little weird. Reuters reports Samsung uh, is going to avoid or hope to avoid those sorts of scenarios by spending $14.7 billion on a new chip facility in Pyeongtaek, 75 kilometers south of Seoul, if you don't understand my pronunciation. It's Samsung's biggest investment yet in a single plant. Samsung is the world's top memory chip maker. A lot of people forget that. Chip making is the only steady 
profit generator in the company. Profits from Samsung's semiconductor division are expected to actually surpass profits from the handset division for the first time in more than three years. Wow. The only steady profit generator. That's yeah, in other words, it's the handset division skyrocketed past it for a while, but now it's falling back to earth, so whereas the, the semiconductors have just been like plugging away. Yeah. Huh. Time now for some news from you. These are things submitted in our subreddit. Uh, we hope you're enjoying the subreddit. It's at dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com. We know a lot of people do. Uh, we've been seeing great things posted in there. It helps inform how we put the lineup together every day. It lets us know what at least a big chunk of our audience thinks is important in the tech world. It supplements what I get from my own feeds and Google News and Tech Meme and all these other sources. Uh, so get in there and let your voice be part of that as well. You can vote stories up. You can vote stories down. You can submit links like Motang did. He passed along a Times of India report that Skype will stop delivering calls on landlines and mobile phones in India starting November 10th. Now, Skype calls outside of India will still be connected. So if you're in India on Skype calling a number outside of India, that'll still work. If you're outside India, like me, you'll be able to use Skype to call a number inside India. So if I want to call somebody in India, I can still put in a phone number and call them from the United States, for instance, or anywhere else outside India. Skype did not give a reason for the change, but India has a law preventing internet-based phone calls originating from India. So companies like Skype usually reroute the calls internationally to circumvent the law. Apparently something about that isn't law. working anymore. Yeah. Why, why would you so if I'm that? in India on Skype, I can't call a landline or mobile phone number from Skype. So they have no voice over IP then? Well, they probably do, but it's probably a way to protect the telecoms from competition from Skype. Yeah, and Skype's been doing this trick that a lot of companies do, like Viber, uh, for instance, that reroute the calls. But apparently something happened where that's not, that's not okay anymore. Whenever I think about incoming calls to India, I got to remember when my Skype account got hacked because I'd forgotten to change the password and it was the same password I'd used on my Gawker Media account that got Ooh, hacked. Yeah. And uh, I went to the gym and came back and I had made $200 in calls to India. Ah. I'd, I had forgotten that my PayPal account was attached to my... Well, now, account. see, this wouldn't change that, actually, because you're outside. No, so, it's, so. Still, it's still good. <laughs> that can still happen. Yay. Yeah. <laughs> my passwords are better now. Good. Let's see. Uh, some character named SP Sheridan submitted to the subreddit the Cult of Mac story that T-Mobile CEO John Ledger responded to questions about bent iPhone 6s while speaking at GeekWire Summit 2014. In his usual, usual sweary manner, Ledger called Ben Gate horse manure, and we might be paraphrasing there, and yeah. said anybody who bends an iPhone is an idiot. Not paraphrasing. Going 12 straight words in a row without cursing, though, Ledger said, the demand for these devices in the last few weeks is unbelievable. He didn't say non uh, uneffing believable, surprisingly enough, and that almost is kind of disappointing. Yeah, it almost sounds like it's not as strong. <laughs> when, John Ledger, when he doesn't curse... You're like, oh, I don't know if he means it anymore. <laughs> He's, I, I think he does well-placed cursing, though. I find him just vastly entertaining. <laughs> the video and the link in the show notes is just fantastic. I mean, we watched the whole thing. We watched the, the iPhone part twice because it was so funny. He's, he's and, impossible and he's to quote if you're certain media outlets, though. <laughs> I, I, he drives drives people nuts. Nuts, I know. Yeah. Uh, Sunbun sent us the Verge report with the latest info on Microsoft's ongoing attempt to turn your entire living room or den or basement, wherever you have your Xbox, into an interactive gaming environment. Yes, this is a Luma room that we heard about at CES. It's back, and it has a new name and new capabilities, now called Room Alive, the latest concept demo, uses video projectors to map the room and the Kinect sensor to track your movement, allowing you to interact with the games on the walls of your living room or any room, actually. Right now, the system is a little too expensive to live out in the wild, but Microsoft really believes it will get cheaper soon. So hang in there. Someday you'll be playing a game and banging your shin against the coffee table because you're playing Halo, not just the Kicks the uh, Kinect balloon game. <laughs> That sounds really fun, but that does sound really expensive. How many connects and how many video cameras you'd need? Well, I think that, I, yeah. I mean, you, you got to bring it down to where it just works in one connect in your yeah. in, in your room. Uh, but it, the Aluma room thing that they showed off at CES was impressive. So I, I like that they're keeping this alive and they're making progress. It reminds me a little, certainly not as dramatic and certainly not as well received as the Oculus, where they're saying, look, we're, we're continuing to work on this and we think it's cool and we're making advancements. And that's what Oculus has been doing. I think people are a lot more excited about Oculus than they are about a Luma Room, but it's still pretty cool. 
Yeah, maybe maybe you don't look like a dork with it on your head at least. That's true. <laughs> for the for the fashion conscious, this may be a better opportunity. Mike B. Kennedy put it sent in a, an article that I think is really, really cool. The US Navy is building swarm boats. These are automated small patrol ships that help protect larger naval vessels while they can resupply in port to prevent incidents like the attack on the USS Cole in 2000. Evidently, while they're resupplying, that's a very dangerous, dangerous time. Wired Magazine describes the technology as autopilot on steroids, allowing, allowing a human operator to control the small craft with a, t a laptop. A swarm boat could also be used to deploy Navy SEALs on a beach and then go back to sea and await instructions. Now these autopilot, what they're talking about there is that the, uh, the person with the laptop, all they're doing is saying, this is a friendly ship, you need to protect it. That one over there, that's a bad ship, go attack it. The swarm boats actually figure out how to execute on that command. So yeah. they're actually driving themselves around saying, oh, I'm going to go eat that one and protect this one. It's like a Zerg rush. You just like select you you select your swarm boats and you click over there and you're like that that's what you're after. Go. Go. Yeah. Go. We it's really need to wonderful. build up our StarCraft player base. Uh, and thankfully Korea is our ally, so maybe we can draw from them. <laughs> That's very cool. SP Sheridan, you're right. He seems to show up a lot on shows that you co-host. That guy. And Captain Kipper submitted stories about Facebook's hidden friend-to-friend -friend payment system coming to light. <laughs> Cult of Mac Stanford student Andrew Oud found code in Facebook's Messenger app referring to the kind of what you need to handle in a payment system, like credit card info and expiration dates, etc. Uh, looks like, from the code, you'd need to add a credit card and a PIN to Messenger to make it work if and when a payment system were to go live in Facebook Messenger. Yeah, I'm going to do Facebook payments right after I ha uh, let them handle my medical information. Yeah, which <laughs> they want to do that too. You know, a lot of people do have payment information stored with Facebook already because they've, they've bought like Facebook stuff. Facebook has those little virtual gift items and there's other other things that they've sold before. So they have a, they have a base from which to do this. And I think a lot more people will do it than you might expect, especially if it's like, hey, want to send money to your friends. That was PayPal's original proposition. And they still they still use that to bring people in. Uh, mm -hmm. Send money to your friends and family. If you're the kind of person today who's been using Facebook as the internet, right? And there's a lot of those people I could see them saying, oh, you mean I could send money to my mom this way? Great. I'm totally going to do that. Do you get the feeling there's only 2 to 3% of us who actually are terrified of this kind of stuff and the rest of the world is going, okay, that sounds fun. You know what I think? Yeah, I, I think there's probably 2 or 3% of us who are actually concerned. I wouldn't even say terrified, but like you really need to be careful Crazy. and do this right. And then there's like 15% who act terrified, but actually will still do it. it. They just, yeah. <laughs> Exactly. I'm probably in that camp. Oh, no, I don't think so. That's uh, a look at the headlines. All right, let's talk about HP. Hewlett Packard Enterprise, which uh, HP in their press release says will define the next generation of technology, infrastructure, software, and services for the new style of IT. Now, that's full of marketing speak, but it, it's backed up by OpenStack Helion, their cloud operation, big data, rack, rack mount servers, uh, HP Financial will be part of this company. This is very solid stuff. They may not be as strong as your some of your Cisco's and IBM's out there, but they're right there in that camp. This is the part of HP that's doing very well. Now, Allison, compare it to the way they describe HP Inc., which again, personal systems, your desktops, your laptops, and printers. HP Inc. will provide leading personal systems and printing company, delivering innovations that will empower people to create interact and inspire like never before. And they mention 3D printing and quote, new computing experiences as what this company will do. So uh, first of all, HP Inc. is not HP I-N-K, right? That's No, <laughs> although that is where it will get all of its money. That is not how it's spelled. <laughs> and that is a way to uh, to kind of remember things. Uh, what's What's bothering me here is their services business, um, you know, we're saying it's doing well, but the margins are not doing that well in that. The uh, HP services revenue is down. Their operating margins are down from 6.9% to 2.9%. It's actually their P their printer and PC business that's doing pretty well. Yeah, um, but the Hewlett, I, I'll let you finish here, but remember the Hewlett-Packard enterprise business has growth potential and the printer business doesn't. 
carry on. Yeah, yeah, but we can't say that they're doing well on the services side, which I find fascinating because most of these big companies that do services, I mean, companies like Oracle and IBM and even Microsoft, you know, we complain about, oh, they're being stupid over here with Windows 8 and everything, but they're over here making giant piles of money on their services business. So how are they not making giant piles of money on their services business? I'd well, like to understand that. I, I think, you know, I, I would characterize it as, yes, they're not making the giant piles of money maybe that the others are making. Making, but they see the potential to be able to do that, uh, and the margins are much worse on on the desktop uh, and laptop sure. side of things. Oh. Where they make all their money in HP Inc. is Inc., like you said, right? Where they can make their money in Hewlett Packard Enterprise is all of this stuff. It can be OpenStack Helion. It can it can be servers. Uh, although the servers margins are lower, it can be big data. Eight, what Meg Whitman is identifying here, in my opinion, is this is the part of the business that's healthy. We still are turning HP around. It's not, it's not well yet. It's not over the sickness, but it's got the best prognosis. The part okay. that can drag us down is declining printer sales. Because don't forget, uh, people are printing less and less. I think printer ink sales were down 15% uh, last year. So that's a declining business. If you've got two businesses that, you know, that when you split them up, they're basically making equivalent amounts of revenue. And one's got a huge upside in the future if you do it right, and the other's got a huge downside no matter what you do. Yeah. I'm st I'm sticking with the one that has the huge upside, and that's what Meg Whitman is doing as CEO while hedging her bets and saying I'm still going to be chairman of the board of the other one. I'm going to be so, in, I'm going to be involved in both of these. If well managed, those that's a that's a correct statement. But you know their printer and PC business is sitting at 18.2 percent operating margins. Where on their enterprise business, what are they at? They're around 14%. Oh, wait, no, no, no. Sorry. Uh, oh, I lost the number. Um, something 6.9 to 2.9 percent. It was their drop. So they're they're not even going in the right direction on that yet. So they're saying it's healthy, but I would have liked to have seen that to maybe be going in the upward direction. Well, and 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 that is the right question to ask, which is. Can, can you actually turn this boat around? And I think what Meg Whitman is asking investors, and investors seem to be responding positively, to believe is, we are turning the boat around. Like, yes, there's a drop, but it's not as bad of a drop. And we all know that the ocean is bigger over here. HP sure, Inc., sure, on yeah. the other hand, yeah, it's got great numbers. Its revenue looks amazing because because you can make so much money off of <laughs> off of selling ink and printers. Uh, well, just ink, not the printers. Um, <laughs> But that's a that's that that's a rating that that that's a lake in California that that thing's drying up, uh, and we need and we need to terrible analogy we need to yeah. strategy. Well, it's a it's an apt analogy if if yes. if a uh, terrifying one for us out here, uh, but it, we need to split that off before it brings the other one down. Is essentially how I see this now. A lot of people are criticizing the big criticism I've seen for HP or Hewlett Packard Enterprise is that by splitting up they lose a scale advantage that is estimated to cost them around a billion dollars not just being able to buy bulk chips right now they can buy they can make huge chip orders for both sides of this business that get them a discount uh, but in other efficiencies of having everything together Whitman told Recode we will have a supply chain arrangement that will allow us to negotiate with them as one company when it makes sense to do that and to negotiate as two companies when that makes sense that's interesting in other words she's saying we're gonna still collude <laughs> <laughs> I, I should not use collude that is a legally loaded word we're still gonna team up uh, and and buy chips together for for cheap. How long is that going to last, though? Because well, let me Rico, tell you, HP Inc. looks like it's being dusted off for sale. Well, Recode also talked about that this is going to be the season for mergers and acquisitions. So right before, uh, or maybe it was a parallel article, they also talked about the fact that it's pretty clear that they're setting up the PC business to be picked up by Lenovo or Dell. And that uh, now that they've split, they've gotten rid of the future boat anchor, which will be the PC and printer business, that they're likely to maybe re-engage with EMC for the merger that never happened there before. So all of a sudden, everything you've said about having these things, uh, you know, we'll still be friends and we'll still do the supply chain agreement together, that, that would not continue to go. The, the other thing that uh, made me kind of curious, um, there was a guy named, I'm not sure how to pronounce it, Les Jack. Le Lejack, L E S J A K. Mm -hmm. I think it's Les Jack, Les but Jack. I could be wrong. He said things like, uh, oh, you have great opportunities to lay more people off if you split a company. 
Well, that's exactly what you say when you put a company together, right? right? Say, I thought the same thing of, when I read that. Get rid of like, HR and so get you, rid of in other words, <laughs> anytime you change anything, you have great opportunities to lay people off if you really are a good yeah. CFO. Which yeah, that, I year. guess that's probably it. But everything he and and he also said something really strange about, oh, we're gonna not lose as much money as you would think in the split because one of the company doesn't companies doesn't have to rebrand because HP Inc. gets to keep the logo. And it was like that was that was a big determining factor in how much this was going to cost was who got the logo. Very, yeah. very strange well, answers I thought that, he gave. That uh, that is a, a valid thing, which is if we have to rebrand, let's say they split these. Because here's the thing: I think a lot of people are missing this or forgetting this or don't know about it in covering this story. They say. HP is abandoning what made it HP and splitting it off HP Inc. and maybe dusting it off for sale uh, and moving in a new direction. It's exactly what they did in the 90s when they split off Agilent. Because uh, mm -hmm. remember, right. HP is best known as the maker of a precision audio oscillator, if you ask someone from the 1940s, right, because right. that's how they started. Your instrument the, division, right? They made it measuring tools. And what they did in the 90s was realize, hey, we're making all this money off computers and electronics. Our measurement Look tools- business. Our measurement tools business is kind of stagnant. Let's spin it off. So they made Agilent. They took everything that wasn't computers and electronics and they put it in Agilent and they spun it off. And that was probably the right decision. You know, history has bore out that Agilent is okay, but Agilent has not. I, Agilent's stock, I think, is about the same amount, worth about the same amount, or maybe I, I, I don't have the terms right, but it's equivalent to what it was when they spun it off. It hasn't grown by leaps and bounds, right? It also right. hasn't failed. And I think so, that's what did Meg that Whitman help is back then. Well, yes, it helped spur HP into becoming the HP that it is today, which is okay. the maker of computers for everybody. Uh, and, and I think that's what Meg Whitman is trying to do now is to say, this is the part that's stagnant. It may not be dead. It may not be dying. We're going to need printers for years, right? But this is not a growth area. So let's spin that out into its own area. Uh, let it become the new Agilent. We'll even let it call itself HP. But we'll be Hewlett Packard. We'll be the trusted name in enterprise. And that's, that's where the growth opportunity is. So you know what bothers me also about the enterprise business um, is that they're bringing the servers to that side. So if you've got a giant corporation and you've got to decide on who am I going to buy all of my computers from and you standardize on HP, you end up with all your server business and all of your desktop business together. But now they've got to make two separate decisions, right? So they might say, okay, well, I'm going to do Dell for my PCs and HP for my servers. And you've got two negotiations. Um, when they talked about the supply chain agreements, they were talking about the other way around, right? Who who needs the leverage to buy parts and stuff to build their equipment. This is the other side of the coin is the companies that do business with HP. And, and I would guess that and I have no facts and data to support this, but that a large portion of their business is enterprise purchases, not the Joe Blow who walks into Best Buy to buy the, the cheapest PC they can find. That's not probably where the revenue is coming from. Well, I, I, I wish I had noted this, but essentially uh, enterprise, there's an, a segment of their enterprise services that is equivalent to their, their ink printer, their inkjet printer sales, and that includes the ink. Uh, and those are their two biggest revenue generators so, right there. See, there's so, facts and data. <laughs> yeah, and and I think I, I and so I I think what you're hitting on is HP coming to this conclusion. And and if I want to read the tea leaves, I look at the fact that Meg Whitman told Recode the decision to split the company up was not made until very recently. I look at the fact that they were trying to buy EMC. They were trying to buy other companies. I think they really did want to keep this together. And Meg Whitman has been saying that for, for almost a year now, like better together, better we've got more efficiency. Key. I think they finally got to the point where they had to make a heart rending decision that they just could not rationalize keeping these together anymore. And even though they will, you know, they wouldn't be able to package up nicely HP computers with the enterprise sales, that might be enough of a benefit sometimes to say, yeah, you want to buy Lenovo, you want to buy Dell, whatever, we, we'll, we'll, we'll handle the whole transaction for you, which with HP Financial, which will be part of Hewlett Packard Enterprise, they might be able to do. Well, isn't this exactly what uh, Leo, uh, let's see if I can do it. Apotheker. Apotheker. <laughs> uh, wanted to, he wanted to do that three years ago, right? And Meg Whitman, he wanted to sell of off. He wanted to sell off personal services. Uh, and I think the stockholders were like, don't oh, just sell it off. That's a bad idea. That's, that's, a, that's your only revenue right now. And I think what's smarter is they're saying, stockholders, guess what? You now have stock in two companies. Okay. And it's going to be income tax free. 
okay. which is a nice thing that for is them. That is different. Uh, and we and we tried really hard, and you all believe we tried really hard to keep these together. So I, th- I think they made a more compelling case. Hmm. And maybe, like she says, if they're healthier now when they sell it, that's a better deal. Yeah. No, I think I think she absolutely is right about that. But fifty-five thousand people. That's and jobs. that's bef- more that's than whether Google. this thing gets split or not, yeah. right? Yeah, like it's more than work at Google. Yeah, no, I know. Google has forty-seven thousand, I think, something like that. So, so yeah, they're going to shed a ton of people before they even consider the split, before the split even happens, and then after the split, they'll be able to shed more people because they'll find that oh, well, we don't need that department anymore, right? You know what's terrifying? It's only seventeen percent of there HP. Three hundred seventeen thousand people there. Yeah. Yeah, maybe that's part of the problem. It could be a lot too of big. People, but God, yeah. that is that a that is a lot of lives impacted. That is uh, that's rough. By the end of October 2015, I'm curious who will be swimming around HP Inc. to buy them. There might even be somebody swimming around Hewlett Packard Enterprise uh, to buy them too. But a, HP Inc. seems like it'd be ripe for someone to to want to pick up. You know, this is a sideways piece of information, but um, the company I used to work for was a government contractor, and we went through and decided that we had a, a, to pick a single vendor to go with, and uh, we had chosen Lenovo, and then within like three days of when we were going to announce it, it turned out they got bought by China. Ah, so right. not so much for a government contractor. Well, now if Lenovo picks up HP, that pretty much leaves you with who? Dell? You mean um, you were going to go with ThinkPads and then Lenovo bought them because Lenovo is a Chinese right. company. Yeah. Right, right. Well, all the HP, the desktops do. But so who's left? American company, Dell? Uh, well, yeah. Lenovo is an American and Chinese company. They have dual headquarters. Yeah, but uh, it's a Chinese-owned corporation. Dell is going to be, you know, if, if big if, someone from, from China, like let's say Lenovo picks up HP Inc., it, it's mm-hmm. not impossible, right. uh, and and a, a government contractor doesn't want to deal with them. They'd have to go with Dell, I guess. That's it, right? Uh, That's all who's left. Well, or there there are other companies, companies that are not in China. They're in Europe. They're in India. They're in Israel. I mean, uh, we used to compete Compaq and HP. Yeah, the problem is, is I I think the problem is that you don't need those desktops as much yeah. anymore. You can go you can go to a Samsung and buy Chromebooks and deploy them for a lot of people. Maybe you know, maybe not for every job. Certainly not for every job. But you need desktops in fewer numbers. Yeah, that, that's Samsung that's what's causing either. all of this problem yeah. right here. Is you don't actually need the equipment in the first place. Not yeah. in the numbers that you used to. Yeah, that's true. That's true. All right, let's take a quick look at the calendar. Tomorrow, October 7th, the Connect goes on sale standalone. So if you bought one of the Xbox Ones without the Connect and you've changed your mind, you can pick one up for $149. Also tomorrow, Microsoft's Project Spark, game creation tool for PC and Xbox One, goes on sale in the Americas uh, on October 7th, in Asia Pacific on October 9th, and in Europe on October 10th. The retail version will sell for $40 U.S., and the Cutting Edge IT and Electronics Comprehensive Exhibition, also known as CTEC, begins tomorrow. Uh, also known as today because it's in Tokyo, actually just outside of Tokyo, <laughs> Japan. Our pick of the day comes from Omnimano in the chat room. Uh, fully functional Reddit rendered as a programming language. Looks like Python, PHP, and others. Uh, important for developers, allowing Reddit browsing in a more discreet fashion on company time. Uh, it's codereddit.com. C-O-D-E-R-E-D-D-I-T.com. Go take a look at it from a distance. It just looks like you're looking at code. It really does. If you look up close, you can tell that's not code. That's Reddit, which is exactly what you probably want if you're looking for something like this. I love clever people. Did you ever do this, Allison? I guess you did, You weren't, it would have been weird to see too much code on your machine, I'm, I'm guessing. No, not too much. Yeah. yeah. It's to feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com and you can find my picks at dailytechnewsshow.com slash picks. A couple of messages before we bow out of here. Mike in Tampa was playing around with his new iPhone 6 Plus and came across a new option called Wi-Fi Scanner in the settings for airport utility. After enabling it and opening airport utility, I now have the option to do a Wi-Fi scan. Even better, the info button on the bottom right goes to a nice summary page showing all the access points grouped by frequency and channel. Not sure if it's limited to the 6, 6 Plus or all devices. I heard anyone else mention it, so I figured I'd pass it on. Ooh, I like that it fun. sorts them by channel. It's interesting to see like which devices are broadcasting on multiple channels. Uh, there's a couple of channels in my area that I didn't. I was not aware there was a broadcast on. I gotta go play with that. Yeah, 
Uh, and then I wanted to let you know that 40 Thieves, who's in the chat room right now, has been working on an IRC bot. Uh, we use something called Showbot when we record the show live to let people suggest the titles that we create uh, for the show. And for the last couple of weeks, he's been working on a bot. He's ironed out most of the bugs. Here's what 40 Thieves writes. I'm calling it Best of Bot. It's designed to help find the best moments of DTNS for an end of the year best of show. Uh, it basically listens in the chat room for messages starting with bang B, followed by a message. When it sees this, it calculates a timestamp relative to the start of current live video on the YouTube channel. This timestamp is then used to generate an emitted YouTube video that starts at the correct time. Wow. Uh, right now, it's at bestbot.40thieve.es. Uh, he's got to get a domain name for it. Hopefully, this can be used as a quick way to find clips for the best of show. Uh, let me know if you have any feedback or thoughts. Also, the code's open source on an MIT license on GitHub, uh, if you're interested in that. Uh, so thank you, Ali. That's fantastic. I uh, really, really, really love this. And this is going to make things so much easier in, in making a best of show. I wish we'd had it all year. Uh, wow. like, so I can't wait for 2015 to have it all year. It is in beta. So he did warn people like, just, you know, be careful. But if you're watching the show live and you see a moment, you're like, oh, I want to say that should be saved for the year end show. You just exclamation point B followed by a message and that tags it. Wow, that is that is so cool. I love yeah. how smart people are. That's amazing. Yeah bestofbot.40thieve.es. So 40 thieves, but with a dot right before the ES. Well, thank you, Allison Strand. Uh, Allison, Allison Strand. Strand. Allison Strand from Call for Help just like got stuck in my head. Oh, because I thought it was because the smart we went to. technology person uh, who is a woman, I guess. Those, those are the three <laughs> things you share with Al and first name Allison. Allison Sheridan, host of NoSillaCast. Uh, at uh, podfeet.com. And of course, you can follow her on Twitter at twitter.com slash podfeet. What do you got going on with Ooh, the casts? I had really good time yesterday. I had uh, Renee Ritchie on my show, and uh, it was so much Renee's fun. He great. comes in about 22 minutes into the show for a segment I call Chit Chat Across the Pond, where I just have random people come in who are sometimes across ponds. And uh, we talked about um, some of the more hidden, cool features in, in uh, iOS, and he seems to know these really obscure details and, and gets really deep. He says he doesn't actually know what he's talking about, but clearly he does, um, and, and explains some of the stuff about pixels and, and pixel densities and stuff that I hadn't really gotten my head around. Uh, we talked for an hour and I was just I was just enchanted the entire time. It was absolutely a blast. So he's from imore.com, of course, yeah. and uh, really, really had a good time with Renee. So check out that show at podfeet.com. Renee's fantastic, smart guy, and runs a good site. So yeah. very, very definitely check out imore.com and then go to podfeet.com and download the, uh, download the uh, chit chat across the pond. I chit chatted across an actual pond with you once. That's right. That's right. We were in front of, uh, over by Disney World, not in Disney World. Yeah, never been to Disney World. <laughs> That's the closest I got was chit chat across the pond with Allison Sheridan. All right. Uh, thank you, boss. Allison Sheridan is one of my bosses, as are 4,319 other people. Uh, thanks to all of you for making the show possible. We are indebted to you, literally. Uh, and so we pay that debt off by doing the show every day, Monday through Friday. We hope you get value out of it. And we're so glad that so many of you are willing to give some value back. DailyTechNewsShow.com slash donate to find the links to our Patreon, uh, to the PayPal button, to the Dogecoin button. I don't know why I laugh every time I say that. It's because it's Dogecoin. It's fun. And Bitcoin. Uh, so and, and any future ways of supporting the show we'll throw in there as well. Sure. Thank you all. What's that? Shirts. Oh, yeah, the T-shirts. They are not, there's not a link to the T-shirts on that page. They're in the description of the show, though. Okay. And don't forget, you can have a voice in what stories we cover at our subreddit, dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com. You can email us, feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com, or give us a call, 512-59-DAILY. It's 512-593-2459. And listen to the show live at mobile.alphageekradio.com. Our website is dailytechnewsshow.com. We'll be back tomorrow with our DTNS correspondent, Patrick Beja. We'll see you then. Or we'll talk to you. I won't see you. Unless you sneak in. This podcast is part of the Frog Pants Studios Network. For more information about this and other shows, visit frogpants.com. Audio program so good, it's like you're there. Yay! Yay. Good stuff. That was fun. Oh, good. I work just as hard too. every time, but I'm less terrified each time.
Good. <laughs> I feel the same way myself. <laughs> I really do. Uh, uh. Tinvec says, if Dogecoin doesn't make you chuckle, it's not doing it right. <laughs> well said. For a really fun chat room. Yeah, our chat room's awesome. They're nice and fun and silly. And they make and... good things. God, that, yeah. That, I mean, uh, think about how much was made today. We have Tinvec and Sebgons making the Tim Moreau seeks out information on the technique. pre-roll thing. Uh, then we've got Omnimono with the pick. Uh, we've got obviously we've got the email from Mike in Tampa. I don't know if he's in the chat room, but we got Forty Thieves making the bot. Al Khalif has made Showbot. Uh, it's just it's amazing. The community is. What do I crazy. do if I have um, a not awesome programming job? that I want people to volunteer for in the chat room. <laughs> what do you mean, not awesome? Well, someone just made us this amazing, like, hey, let's clip the best of show moments, but we have an entire year's worth of shows that we have to go Before back and that. look at. Right, so what do we do about year? the rest of the year? Yes. So let this serve as my official notice to the chat room. I'm accepting volunteers. I will put up, like, a maybe a doc or a spreadsheet uh, saying who would like to look at which uh, episode and just find me some best of moments because I just thought, like, what if I had to look at them all and I sort of fell over a little bit? <laughs> I, if you well, I know you were logging notes. You were logging a few at one point. Would, it, uh, there is a document that Jackie Hearn created, like, that's a best of, which is probably where they should go. So Okay, um, yeah, that's it. Yeah, that's Seb Gans is right. We should just create an archive and everyone can pick an episode and run through them. Oh, good that's, idea. You know, like if every person who's in chat right now picked an episode, we'd probably have almost, we'd have all but like 30 of them done. So that's, that's my next thing. And I've got to get that done by like November. <laughs> so more to come, but you have been. Isn't no November less than a month away? Yes. How terrifying is that? Uh, next year, we won't have this problem at all. Well, the problem this year is when we when I started the show January 2nd, I wasn't sure there'd be any best of moments. Right. You know, it could have just sucked all year. <laughs> well, yeah, but the moment Molly invited the entire internet to your show, that ensured that there would at least be one best of moment. Just just Molly doing it, yeah. Just yeah. Molly doing that <laughs> that, was the that it was... <laughs> worth having I forgot about that i did not because it is top of my list you're good like six random people showed up in your show i, I, I can't Great. remember i remember ashley escada being one of them there was somebody yeah. else whose name i recognized and then a few chat room names i recognized right and i felt bad because i'm just like hanging up on <laughs> see best of Great. yep Great stuff. it's worth it all right um hp slash two Oh, right. Sorry. Divided by two is what that means? Oh, HP divided by two. Yeah, okay. That yeah, I didn't sense. get it right away. I like HP Inc. Because, of course, it was my joke. Yeah, that was I a good one. <laughs> did you, now, did you invent that all on the fly? Because that right was impressive. Because you kept saying HP Inc. Well, yeah. I, I'm going to Google it to see who else invented it. <laughs> well put. It's, gonna be a, it's actually going to be a, almost impossible to tell because... Yeah, how are you going to Google HP Inc.? <laughs> yeah. No one I'm, I'm fine with it, even headline. if somebody else did use it. Yeah. Payface and face payment are hilarious, too. <laughs> Payface just... Isn't Payface. that an I, it crowd? What was the one in it crowd? Face, face it place. It crowd? You mean IT crowd? Uh, you can say it either way. Really? It's yeah. acceptable? It was originally supposed to be it crowd, and then everybody kept calling it IT crowd, and wow. its creator said, yeah, it's fine. Call it IT crowd if you want. It was supposed to be like on a play on the it, you know, the it girl, the it things okay if you remember that and i guess it didn't work i remember sitting in ireland when we met bart for the first time well first and only time sitting in his kitchen with the it crowd up on a laptop on his kitchen counter watching it that's how i was introduced to it ah uh, yes but they had uh, splits think of the printers <laughs> yeah, i like that too that's oh divorce, my god that's a divorce you... kids joke i love that joke i love that joke that's definitely good Sorry, Leo Apotheker. Now I can pronounce it. Now, yeah, both of us got it right, finally. Leo. It's Leo Apotheker. Another good one. 
Think of another good one. Think of the WebOS children. I love <laughs> the That's a deep cut. Oh, that's a deep cut. <laughs> WebOS. Right. Where did WebOS go? LG from? owns WebOS now. Oh, Apple drops Sapphire and it breaks. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, you're right. I don't understand that story at all. And I wrote it, and so I'm to blame that I didn't dig deeper because it made... What I wanted to say about it was, I think this sounds like Wall Street crap, which is, yeah, but oh, that I'm caused sorry. It. Yeah, but then I thought that wasn't like something Tom should read. But it just sounds like <laughs> like that gut Wall Street reaction with the look, it wasn't in the iPhone 6, bad company. Or it's like it's going to be in the watch. Well, I'm still with Allison, though. Like, even if your stock takes a dump, you don't file bankruptcy. Right. No, no. So, so something, something else, else is going on there. There was more to that story, and I felt like, irresponsible for not digging deeper but like now I looked it, and it, just, that, it is to your credit that you felt like digging deeper and it would have been cool if you did but i felt okay with it as it was simply because the tech of it is hey the folks who made the sapphire thing are filing for bankruptcy and is that interesting, interesting. Yeah. um and why it becomes a business story of why um, right that i guess that's fair we know um, apple was blamed for dragging down the stock market last week right it was oh, all okay, apple's yeah. fault Apple always gets blamed for all kinds of things. <laughs> Business. I'm just, well, no, I'm gonna I'm gonna keep my crazy notions to myself. <laughs> this is a very responsible show. We keep it responsible. Um, gotcha. Uh, let's see. All right. So. Molly. Oh, I thought it said Molly invented the entire internet. Yes, <laughs> she did. Well, she had she had help. Or an Al Gore. <laughs> oh, you know what I'd like to know, Tom? You talked, I think it was in an after show. Friend uh, face. Thank you, BioCow. Okay, yes, go ahead, Alice. <laughs> um, you talked about the limit that you hit when archive.org was not able to hold it. What uh, What was that limit? How could you tell that you'd hit a limit? Because <laughs> people couldn't download it anymore. At it's all? Not, it's, not oh. like a, it's not like a set limit that they're like, when sure. you go above this amount, it's. It, I think it's a natural limit that archive expects this much traffic at any given link. And mm -hmm. so it builds its network to accommodate that. And when you go past it, you're at risk of, you know, mm -hmm. too many people trying to access the link at the same time and it gets slowed Just down. Just wondering how many podcasters are probably well under that limit and don't need to be spending money with the oh, listens I, and blueberries. DTNS is the only show that I, that I have ever run Had into ha that having to be a, really yeah, that becoming an issue. Yeah. Oh. And I know Scott Johnson has run into it with a couple of his shows like the instance. Um, but, but yeah, I, mm. an archive from what I can tell, and, and I've been waiting for someone to disabuse me of this notion, they don't mind. They're like, we, we want to have all of this information. We're the library of the internet. So yes, please file a copy with us. And if people, you want to use it and link out to it, that's great. The downside of it is at a certain point, they're not going to support the reliability of that link over time. Sure. So if everybody's trying to use it and that's what happened to DTNS. Everybody's trying to use it at once. They're not going to send extra resources to make that one sure, available, sure. right? Um, and that's fair. That's that's. But for most podcasters, for. yeah, interesting. I've and I I also donate to archive.org because I feel like it's this we'll value for value it. model, right? I'm, sure. like, I'm getting so much out of them. I want to give them something back, and they are a nonprofit. Yeah. I had uh, Stuart Chaffee on my show a while ago, and people were bugging me to have him on again. I could ask him whether they really want you to do that. <laughs> yeah, ask him what their what their attitude is about. I mean, their policy is clear. You're you're not breaking any terms of service or anything right. when you do it. But, but are they like, oh, we didn't really mean that? Are they like, or they yeah, we hope too many people don't do that. You know, or is it like, no, it's fine. You know, you'll run into that natural limit eventually anyway. Yeah. Yeah, I've always recommended for a starting podcaster to get a free blog account, Audacity, FeedBurner, and archive.org. Because eventually you'll have to, you know, eventually you can upgrade all those tools uh, into something nicer if you want, but that will, you can do a podcast for free. I think most people who start podcasts really want to play with equipment though, and they're like, well, I need it, pile PR40, and I need If it. that's why you're doing it, that's yeah. different, then that's fine. But I, I do know people who are like, well, I would do it, but I don't want to spend all the money. And I'm like, well, that shouldn't be your, yeah. that should get in your way. And I still upload uh, DTNS to archive.org. I use their embeddable player. 
and that's how the AUG version is created automatically. That oh, Metal so you Freak do it anyway. oh, puts really? in a file, and yeah, and the video is hosted up there because the video oh. isn't uh, as popular. Yeah, popular. I love watching it. You know, this show just supplanted watching the morning news for us. We used to watch television, and now we just carry my iPad around the room and try to get it to connect to Bluetooth. <laughs> do do you need uh, me to do more weather and celebrity gossip then, or? <laughs> oh God, I've been I've been so. Traffic uh, reports. Before we start watching you, we were watching I don't know the Today Show, and they've been talking about somebody's baby, for and North it's. Like, one of the newscasters, though, had a baby. Oh. And so Savannah. they bring the baby Savannah on. Guthrie. Oh, yeah, they got to bring the baby on. We got to meet the baby. We got to meet the grandparents. We gotta, and, and, but it's been going on for weeks they've been talking about this baby. So I want, uh, but I have to say, I want 1% of the, no, 0.5% of the credit for Savannah Guthrie's rapid rise because she and I covered the Michael Jackson trial together when she was at Court TV. And I really? sat her down one day on the couch and I said, you are one of the most talented broadcasters I have ever met and you will go very, very far. I can wow. absolutely see you being the head of the network show. Thank you very much, Jenny Josephson. <laughs> yeah, she thanks you every time she's on the air, right? If she she's showing her also baby. Also, literally one of the nicest people you've ever Aww. met. Like, now you're making me feel bad for not loving her baby. No, well, I, I look, I, I get the morning news fluffy part of that, but like Savannah is actually, and that is a cutthroat industry of like the morning news is like, oh boy. Uh, yeah, they don't but, do that much news. Not a lot but, of news on that show, on the Today well, Show. Yes, has. CBS has a little bit more hard news on their morning show. Um, My favorite is how a little a lot biased of the shows, there, but uh, they consider it news to talk about their other television shows. You know, they'll yeah, they'll talk about other shows on their own network. It's a promotional vehicle. It's, it's the not one news. thing tons it's of people news. are, and by tons I mean a respectable number of people are still watching because they're certainly not watching the evening news. Yeah, but that's not news. Here we go. There's Jenny's media moment for today. <laughs> Not news. Is Erica Hill still doing the uh, news on no, on no. CBS's uh, is, morning? No. It's now it's Charlie. It's this, a very um, interesting combination of Charlie Rose, uh, who doesn't come awake till like the second hour, uh, Gail King, Oprah's best friend, mm -hmm. and I forget who uh, I forget who is the third. Nora O'Donnell, maybe is the third so, er person. But Erica still works there, doesn't she? Let's, see, let's find out. We are going to use the maybe power she's just doing of doing the Laker net. Uh, hold on. The Linker net. Oh, a lovely human being. Um, there are a Today Show co-anchor, Weekend Today Show co-anchor. So Weekend. she left CBS. She's, and so she stopped. She's stopped. That's right. She went to NBC. I forgot right. about that. And right. she's a co-host, not a news. Yeah. Group. That's right. Um, yeah, I, I've long wanted to make a list of like the nicest people in television. Uh, and then I thought I would just get in trouble for but, leaving people like, off. Right. For leaving it, wouldn't people be, it wouldn't be that you'd get in trouble for putting people on. It'd be like, why yeah. am I not on that list? But like as an ex literally an example of how to succeed at the absolute highest level and still be a basically good human being. Uh, and that is a very small list, but uh, I'm lucky to have met a number of them. Look at me getting all nostalgic. <laughs> all right. I am publishing, and I'm going to immediately be nostalgic for this episode. Ah, oh, yeah. remember when we remember? did that episode about HP? That was so sweet. You know, I did put this in my uh, document for the chronology of tech history, because I feel like this is one of those events that you know. Historical thing, yeah. yeah. The day HP split again. Yeah, yeah, again. I tried to get a hold of a friend of mine, but uh, she was an executive at HP until about three years ago. Worked there for twenty-five years, and I thought I could have gotten some fun out of her, but I couldn't catch her. Uh, that's too bad. I'm good. Yeah, it'd be really interesting four days from now when nobody cares anymore. Depends on how juicy it is. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right, uh, I think everything is good. Did you pick a title? Yeah. You HP pick? splits. Think of the printers. Okay. That was good. That is, that is the emotional resonant title. Um, hey, I'm a sucker for a think of the, <laughs> think, of the children. think of the children joke. <laughs> the yeah. Children. Uh, well, the exciting news is I'm going to Costco after this ends. 
for the first time with my own card. And for the <laughs> second time in all of time. How about that? Whose card have you been using? No, I never went. I, like, went once with a married couple who was, like, moving in in L.A. And I drove them there because they didn't have, like, a big car yet. Gotcha. And I watched them have, like, a 45-minute debate over what frozen items they should have in their house. And I was like, I'm never coming here again. <laughs> and then <laughs> it was, like, a real, like, real married people discussion. I think and Costco's then, a really dangerous place, though. I, I got out for under $300 once, and it's because uh, I'd been there the day before. I came oh. home with a dragon inflatable boat one time. <laughs> I don't own a pool. <laughs> We oh, filled man. it with water and put the kids in it. It was ridiculous. That's hilarious. All right. Uh, I'm going to say goodbye, video audience. You are Bye. lovely. Don't Bye, change a thing. Audience. We'll see you next time.